Right. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, tonight, and open to the book of Job. Job chapter number, well, we'll, we'll, eh, we'll start in chapter number 39. We'll make our way over to 40 there. Job chapter number 39. We have uh, a great deal of the uh, book of Job is... Uh, Job's friends bringing some uh, words of encouragement and, uh, and Job answering them. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting because you'll notice when we come down just a little bit further, and I don't know that we, we may not be able to discuss it just tonight, uh, but even though we're reading these verses, and of course it is in Scripture, and, uh, but God is listening to Job and his friends also. And there comes a point where God says, I'm going to require something of the friends that have come to encourage Job. But Job has every single time turned around. I, I think it's kind of interesting because, uh, I, and I'll just, I'll just touch on this and we, we won't discuss it a great deal because uh, it deserves probably a little more time. The, uh, the friends that uh, were coming to, quote, encourage Job, in the process of doing this, the way they were going to do this is they were coming to try to find out blame. And they're trying to uh, pinpoint, if you would, uh, somewhat of why this is all happening, Job. And uh, blame is an interesting thing because there's two portions to it. When someone is trying to attribute blame, they are oftentimes saying, okay, we want you to take responsibility for what has been done. And then we're also want to ID the blame so that you would make the adjustment so that you don't do it again. Now, it would make sense. The only problem is that was not the case. And uh, oftentimes we uh, we'd want to try to assess uh, blame in some instances. And there is some, uh, some good reason behind some of that. If somebody is responsible for correcting something or uh, paying restoration or whatever the case may be, then yes. There has to be some time that an evaluation is made and somebody is given the assessment that there needs to be some, uh, some reaction to what has taken place. If their, if their actions has caused difficulty, harm, and things of that nature, there's some time that that needs to be cared for. But on the other side, over here, it's like, okay, well, let's not do that again. Don't, uh, you've paid restitution or whatever the case may be. Now, uh, the reason why we had to attribute their responsibility and blame is so it doesn't happen again. Those things make sense to us because there is a rational reason that responsibility needs to be adhered to. And since that is the case, they are trying to point blame at Job and say the reason why you're sick and the reason why your wealth is gone and the reason why your health is gone and your family and everything else is because of, and they begin to try to attribute blame in that manner, but it wasn't exactly the case. And uh, there was even some instances where, of course, there, uh, these friends that were coming to encourage him were uh, beginning to try to uh, tell Job, of course, it's because you didn't trust God, because you didn't. But the truth is, it was because Job was trusting God that those things were happening. And so because of that, uh, God comes down to an end and says, because Job is answering back the friends on occasion. And, uh, and he is telling them that, you know, the, you know, he's miserable. There's no doubt about it. You can read through it. And, uh, but there finally comes a point where God begins to step in and begins to uh, clarify some things and, and bring things to light. Chapter number 39 gives examples of things that are hard to understand, yet God had made them like they are. Job's friends has been trying to, like I said, attribute blame. Finally, that has kind of uh, settled just a little bit. And now Job and God are beginning to address some things a little bit more. And I want you to notice the very first word of chapter number 39 is, Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rocks bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? Now, all of these things are things that can be noted and looked at and, and can be uh, recorded uh, so that we could plan on them. All right. It, it's like planting and harvest and things of that nature. Some of those things we can, uh, we can look at and know this is going to be the time. But what God is getting at is this. It's like, but why? 
Why is that the time? And uh, we have to just kind of throw up our hands and say, well, it, it just always has been. It just is. God says, no, I did that. That's because that's what I choose. Why does the sun come up in the east and set in the west? Well, it just, that's just the way it is. Well, the earth rotates. He says, I, I know that's the way you explain it, but it's because I did that. And so God in the entire chapter of 39 is literally telling Job the reason why these things take place and the reason why things happen is because I ordained them. That's why. And he is giving some instruction, giving some, uh, uh, it's kind of funny because uh, Brother, Brother Roloff uh, preached a message from this chapter one time it, uh, in verse number 21. And he's talking about the, uh, he says, he paweth in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He's talking about the, uh, the horse and things of that nature. Uh, verse number 19, uh, hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Hast thou made him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley. And, uh, and Brother Roloff preached a message, pawing in the valley. <laughs> and so it uh, just reminded me of that when I was reading through some of these things. Uh, but in that instance, there's some uh, amazing things that God is saying. He is the one that watches over all these things. He's the reason why these things happen. He's the reason why things are put in place. I, I know that sometimes we, uh, we think things happen just by accident, but there is not one single molecule of your body that God does not know. And uh, in that instance, we are amazed by how that we're made up of, of certain atoms and molecules and everything that, uh, that puts us together. But understand something, God knows every single one of them. And I know we think, well, he just kind of uh, puts things in place and they just kind of chatter along. That's not the case whatsoever. God is very intricately involved and knows to the nth degree every single aspect of who we are and what's going on. And he is reminding Job of that very thing. So when we finally come to one of the questions that, uh, that comes in the, uh, in the life of Job and in the book of Job, we've, uh, we've looked at uh, a few of them before. I'll, I'll just mention them very quickly and then we'll talk about the fourth one uh, this evening. Make sure I can uh, read them off here to you. Well, I said that, but because I had them all written in one spot. It's a little easier than going through my pages. We looked at initially, uh, we shouldn't blame God when we experience pain and suffering. Uh, number two, Satan is our accuser and God is the one who believes in us. Number three, God allows even the faithful to be tested. And, uh, and number four tonight, God's people should trust even during a uh, painful circumstance. God's people should trust even in painful circumstance. I want you to notice when we come to chapter number uh, 40, because God has prefaced everything that he is doing by saying, I am the one that has sovereignly done everything that you understand. The things that you think you can attribute to how uh, the seasons come and how the animals react and how these things take place, it's because I have chosen to do that. So when we come to chapter number 40, uh, we are reminded of some of these things. Now, is Job in great pain? Yes. He is mentally in a great deal of pain. He is physically in a great deal of pain. And so in this instance, he does not know exactly what's going to take place in the future, but he is, he is correct in saying God is still in the future. Even though I may be hurting, even though my circumstance may not be that which I have chosen, and, uh, but... In the same token, I still know that God is able. And uh, in that instance, we come here because Job has made some occasions where he has made some uh, statements that uh, oftentimes uh, as a child of God and under the pain that he's under, you and I would say, well, I understand why he's doing that. But God says, but why would you do that? And uh, he understands him very clearly, but Notice when we come to chapter number 40 and verse number one, the Bible says, moreover, the Lord answered Job and said. Now, the good thing about it is even Job has been in anguish, even though Job has been in pain. And even though all of these things would come, even his friends are trying to blame him and saying, because you are not right with God, that's why it's happening. I think it's interesting to take note of this. Out of all of those things, God is still talking to Job. And he is still willing to talk to him. Let, let me put it like this. When everything falls apart, you can still talk to God. 
and he will still speak to you. That's the good thing about uh, having a sovereign God. And in verse number one, it says, moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, and now he's going to put him in his place somewhat. Shall he that contendeth with the almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. So one of the first things that we need to understand when God's people, uh, when we have to trust God, even in the midst of pain, because pain will oftentimes have us do things, say things, and behave in a manner that may not normally uh, be the case. But when we're hurting, we find that sometimes we react to things a little bit more sharply. Everything is, uh, it, it's an open wound and everything is raw and open and, it's, and we're very susceptible to it. The other day I was, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny, I had a, uh, in the wintertime, uh, maybe you, you've experienced that too, but because uh, of the cold and the heat and things of that nature and just the gloves and whatnot, uh, but, uh, but my fingers sometimes will crack. And in the process of that, and I try to keep something on them so they don't, but at the same token, it just doesn't stop it. But, uh, and so when, they, when your fingers crack on the end, what happens is if you don't stop it, it'll just keep hurting and you'll keep bumping into things and whatnot and it doesn't improve. So the way that I keep that from happening is I, I squeeze the, the, the crack that is there and then I put super glue on it. And uh, so it keeps it from, from, from going, uh, you know, cracking open and going on. And so, and it stays on there until it kind of heals up and everything's fine. Well, I, I hadn't put anything on there for a while and it began to callous up a little bit. And so I, uh, I'm looking around for something to kind of cut that off or something or another so I could uh, glue it. And I couldn't find anything, but I happened to, uh, uh, I had a, a little multi-tool that I'd picked up from the Bass Pro Shop and I opened it up and it had this saw on it. And I'd never used the saw before and it was sharp. So I'm, I'm sawing the, the callus off with this thing and all of a sudden, in the process of doing that, I caught my thumb with that really sharp file of things. And uh, there was no callus on my thumb. And it's like, man, that hurts. And uh, so I, I get the one, you know, put together. And uh, so in the process sometimes of trying to correct one, you injure another. And, and now, even though the, the one that's super glue, I don't have any problem with that at all. But that little spot that I, that I jab with that, that little thing, man, every time... Now, everything happens. I go to wash my hands, like, ow, that hurts. You know, I, I go to grab something, it's, ow, that hurts. It's like, I'm going to have to put one of those, uh, uh, I, I was trying to give uh, Charlie one of my uh, uh, Minion Band-Aids over there. I said, do you want a sticker? That's the only, the only sticker I had. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my thumb, I guess. But uh, uh, in that instance, it is a reminder that sometimes when, we're, when something is open and raw, you react and you, you flinch. Same thing is happening to Job now because everything now is very, very open. And, uh, and so when friends come, he's very sharp. And when things happen, he responds kind of sharply. And uh, even in that, God comes and says, I know that you're hurting, but that does not mean you should react in just a, a manner that is not Christian. You should still operate the, with the fact that I am God. The very first thing that he, God is reminding Job here in chapter number 40, and the reason why we have to trust God, even in the midst of pain, is, is one, remember God is sovereign. Number one, God is sovereign. He, he was just prefacing everything he's getting ready to talk to Job about by saying, I can do some amazing things. I have done amazing things, and I will continue to do amazing things. I know that right now you're hurting, but the truth is you still should not allow that hurt to come forth in, uh, in anger and different things along those, along those lines. And so in verse number one and two, we see that uh, God is reminding, uh, he is reminding Job that he is sovereign. He understands that he's upset and he understands that sometimes he may question God. That's not outside the boundaries of what God is very used to and it's very a normal reaction. But he says in the process of questioning, he says, keep in mind this, be careful how you do things, say things, because uh, once you get on a roll, you may go further than what you expect. He said, so don't allow, and, it's, and the whole element is this, you're hurting, you don't believe that you deserve to be hurt, and now your pride is going to come to the, the surface. And pride is always something that has to be abased. And so in that manner, God is reminding Job, I know that you're hurting. But even in the process of that, 
Don't forget who you are and whose you are. And so he goes on in, in, uh, in that verse and he begins to, <laughs> so he asks him almost a, uh, a rhetorical question because the answer is given within it. Because he says, as he goes on, and uh, he that reproveth God, let him answer it. In other words, he says, can you do better? Now, I know that we would think that, well, <laughs> I think that today's society probably thinks, oh, yes, we can do better than God. <laughs> I'd like to see him. I'd like to see them create oxygen enough for the entire mass of, of humanity. I would like, uh, I, I would like them uh, to see how that they would supply the, the needs of all the, the human mankind on earth, yet God does. And how he sus sustains everything just perfectly. How do you keep the earth from drawing any closer to the sun? The gravitational pull is just perfect for our environment. And uh, just to uh, try to look at that, and uh, God does a pretty good job. He really does. So in that manner, he's coming to Job and he says, now, Job, how do you think you would do it? Now, we always have a very simplistic way of doing it. God has a very intricate way of doing what he can do. So he is reminding Job, do you think you can give the horse strength? Well, no. Well, I do. Do you think you can give the, the thunder noise? Well, no, I do. And he goes right on down the line and, and reminds him of that. And even as we go a little bit further, he reminds him of some of the amazing beasts of this world that would bring fear within the hearts of men. And he says, do you think <laughs> that very thing that you can see right there that you can experience brings great fear and, uh, and to you? Don't you think that I'm the one that made that? It is incredible as we go down. So number one, remember God is sovereign and he is uh, mentioning those things. But number two, I want you to notice the humble response, the humble response that comes because in verse number three, it says, then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am vile. Now you say, Job, you're going through a whole lot and it's at the hand of God and God's getting on to you and now you're still repentant. He says, yes, because I have allowed pride to come to the surface. My injury and my hurt and my friend's blame now has brought to a point where, where pride has come to the surface and that's gotta be dealt with. And he says, I shouldn't even have said that. He says, out of everything that God has ever done for me, why in the world would I say anything against him? And he says, behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken? but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. He said, I've learned a lesson. Number one, remember God is sovereign. Number two, the humble response. Words mean things. God is reminding us there that sometimes when we, uh, we use words that uh, they do mean things. And in that manner, God is reminding him of this. <laughs> Your words do mean things, but my words have power. And so in that manner, that humble response is brought about in reminding Job of two things. One, your words, yes, they do mean things. Yes, they do cut. Yes, they are going to uh, give an expression. But at the same token, when I speak, things change. And when I speak, things happen. And so in that instance, he is reminding Job, can you make the sun come up in the east with your words? <laughs> no, I can. So he said, Job said, I'm not going to talk anymore. He said, I, I realize that my words are, are very simplistic. And even though I say them and have some meaning behind them, I have to remember who I'm talking to and who I'm speaking to. And he says, and I don't want the rest of the world to hear me uh, saying things that would be out off color, even towards God. Even in the midst of my pain, they may understand it. He says, but God doesn't deserve it. Do you understand that sometimes even when we're upset with God, God has big shoulders. He can take it. But I want you, you and I to understand this. God never deserves our, our anger towards him. Never does. I, I know that we get that way and I know that sometimes we're upset. I know that sometimes we get, but he does not deserve it. And uh, in that manner, God is reminding Job of that very thing. And Job's humble response is brought to a point because <laughs> that's, why, that's why Satan couldn't get the better of him because Job knew how to respond to God and was willing to do it. 
I know sometimes that we know the response that we're supposed to give to God, but sometimes we're not willing to do it because we just want to be angry for a little while. And it's kind of strange because in the process of doing that, what is being accomplished by that time that is lost? And what are we doing as far as our favor towards God in that manner? And so God is saying, I know that you're hurting, but I don't deserve that. And when you get into a habit of doing that, it's going to be a very recognizable action. And any, I used to say this all the time, and I haven't said it in quite some time, but it's very true. A path that is often walked is easily found. So if, you're, if, if it's easy to get upset with God and you do it on a regular basis, guess what? Each time you do it, the length of time that you're upset with him will grow longer and longer. That's why God is in this manner reminding, you need to keep a humble response. And when Job responds by saying, I am vile, what shall I answer thee? He says, I have no answers. I have none. You are the answer to everything that is here. And Job recognizes that in verses uh, four and five. And then uh, I, I think it's interesting because uh, the next thing that takes place, as Job was speaking here in verse number five, once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. He's saying, I did this more than once. And since I did, you recognize the pattern that's there? I did it once and I, I found that it kind of gave me a little bit of alleviation. So I did it again. He says, but I'm not going to do that anymore. He says, I only thought it was help. I only thought it was salving my conscience. He says, but it didn't do anything but, but bring God's attention uh, that I need to be straightened up a little bit more. And so when Job finally came to a point where he said, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna get myself in check. Notice what happens in verse number six. The Bible says, notice that very first word, then. Huh. I wonder if God is wanting to give you an answer, but he's waiting for you to finally come to a humble spot first. Why is it that God has to bring us to a point where we have to come to that point and get to the then? Why does he have to finally bring us to a point where we have to realize that, oh, now I'm grateful that he does, believe me. And I'm grateful that he's willing to be patient, long suffering. And I'm, I'm grateful that he's willing to work with Job and anybody else to bring them to a point where they will finally say, okay, I realize now why. I realize my pride. I realize my, uh, my injustice towards him. Because the second that you come to that point, then God begins to do a great deal more. But until we finally come to that, that point, in other words, I jot it like this, humility will initiate God's mercy and direction. Humility will initiate God's mercy and direction. Because in this point, Job, of course, has been physically miserable, spiritually or mentally he's been miserable. His friends have been miserable friends. And he uh, has finally come to a point where he said, I allowed them to come and badger me to my pride came to the surface. And that had to be dealt with. God's dealt with it. I realized that I was putting God on uh, trial just a little bit, got that uh, taken care of. And now as he realized, I'm not going to say anything else because the truth is every time I open my mouth, sometimes pride spews out, I'm not saying a thing because God does not deserve that. And in verse number six, when finally humility finally was the point that he initiated, we see then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, gird up the loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also uh, disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that, has, uh, that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? I think sometimes he is reminding us in verse number eight and nine that pride towards God is really futile. It really is. And he is reminding us of that very thing because he, he comes down just a little uh, bit further and he begins to address those things. Verse number 12 says, look on everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. He is reminding him of that very thing. God's people should trust even in painful circumstance. Number one, remember God is sovereign. He is the one that is sovereignly doing things. He is never wrong. He just isn't. When you and I can finally come to a point where we recognize the fact that God is not going to make a mistake. 
And uh, since he is not going to make a mistake, God is always on his A game. We look around us and we think, Lord, this is a mess. He says, I know. Sin is very messy. It is. And uh, that's why he once again says, but I need my people to uh, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God knows what's going on. When you remember that he is sovereign, he has the ability to do what needs to be done and can do that. And he is in the midst of everything that's going on. In the, <laughs> I, I, I get upset with people when I see them uh, trashing our country. I get upset. I, I get angry. I do. And I remember the, uh, the individuals that have paid a major price and, and what needed to be done so they can make those foolish statements. The very freedom that was fought for is so they can be chuckleheads. And that's the reason why. And so do they have a right to do it? Yes. And I would stand up for it. Do I think they're, do I think they're brain dead? Yes. But they have a right to do it. The problem is, is they don't realize that they're beginning to tread a path that will begin to relinquish their freedom. And, uh, and in that process, so it's, uh, it, 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 it's almost a double-edged sword because I can't throttle them, but they need to be throttled. So I take it to God and I say, Lord, please. He says, I see what's going on. He said, in order for me to be God, I have to allow things to take place so that people can recognize me as God. And uh, in that manner, uh, it, it's somewhat frustrating, but he says, you're going to live in the midst of that. That's why he made the, he told the disciples, look, I'm sending you out as, as, as sheep before wolves. He says, but I'm still the shepherd. The wolves are out there, but you stay close to the shepherd, you'll be all right. And so in that manner, he is reminding us, there's going to be evil that surrounds you. I know it is. Sin is very ugly. It's very messy. Don't get involved with it. Remember God is sovereign. Number two, remember the humble response that we ought to have towards God. Number three, humility will initiate God's mercy and direction. And then of course, lastly, pride towards God really is futile. And in this manner, we see here, as he is reminding Job, even in the end of uh, chapter number 40, the fact that there are creatures in this world that bring fear to you. I'm the one that made them. Keep that in mind. I am still able to do what needs to be done. Now, seeing that's the case, sometimes even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of the things that we would not choose, God still reminds us, I'm still sovereign. You may try to put me on trial, but the truth is it's going to be futile to do that because I still am on my A game. I still know what's going on and I still know exactly what needs to be done. In that manner, that uh, gives us just another question, basically, that, uh, that Job is answering in this particular book. We've got one more that we will look at uh, in the weeks to come. And so, uh, but just keep in mind this. About the time that you think, God, I think something needs to happen in this world. He says, good, humble yourself and start praying. And, uh, and watch what takes place, because then is when God will begin to give the direction and mercy. All right, let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed this evening. Thank you again for being here the, uh, tonight. And uh, during the time of, of Thanksgiving, uh, just keep in mind, we have a great deal to be thankful for. We really do. And uh, if nothing else, God deserves to be thanked. He just does. And so uh, please remember that if you would. And let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for the privilege that you have allotted us. God, I do ask that you'd please help us now to uh, do your will, to walk circumspectly according to it. And Father, I do ask that you'd please lead, guide, direct. Thank you for your kindness, for your safety, and for your watch care. I ask that you'd please just lead and guide us now. Thank you again for everything that you do, and thank you for our church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be dismissed.